paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. A very strange object was seen by him, and uh, today it stands the test of time of one of the most bizarre incidents in the world of ufology. These stories are some of the strangest experiences ever described in the UK. We can't tell if they're true, but they are all recounted by ordinary people. Now, they are your witnesses. When I was very, very young, I had memories of a number of past lives. Reincarnation. Experience of a past life. A genuine paranormal experience or a trick of the mind. Jenny Cockle believes she is the reincarnation of a woman who lived in a village in Ireland over 80 years ago. This is her story. One of the earlier memories was of standing on a jetty with the wind blowing at me, my shawl wrapped around me to try and keep warm, at dusk, um, waiting for a boat. And I always wondered what, what the boat was, what I was waiting for, because I could never remember that bit, just standing there again and again, waiting for a boat. From early childhood, Jenny Cockle saw nothing unusual about her vivid experiences of previous lives. Mary Sutton actually lived in the village of Malahide, just outside Dublin. Jenny believes that she was Mary Sutton in a previous life. One of those lives, certainly the strongest of those lives, was as Mary, a mother of eight children, in Ireland. Um, husband, I remember, working on some sort of building work. And the time period was from just before the turn of the century until the 1930s. She was getting on for four the first time I discovered anything about this. She'd gone off to the little local Sunday school with her brother and she came back and I was at the sink washing up or something like that and she came and perched on a high stool at my side and I said, well, did you enjoy it? What was it like? Oh, she said, yes, it was very nice. I enjoyed all the singing, but they kept talking about life and death. Nobody said anything about what their last life was like, what they remembered of it. And I just said, well, no, it's actually a lot of people, this isn't something that everybody believes in or understands. It's called reincarnation when it happens. And it's not, not generally accepted. I reached the point where I realized that other people weren't talking about their past lives. And I wanted to know if it was because it was private and you weren't supposed to, or, or what, what was the reason. So I started talking to my mother. And then, of course, it was, it was um, described to me as a belief rather than a reality, which I found very confusing. I believe that culture uh, is probably the dominant influence. I mean, for example, in this country, if a child does remember a past life and starts to talk about those memories, the chances are, because of our culture, that we will dismiss them as being imagination, uh, maybe something that the child has seen on television, and, and not pursue it, not assume that it's a past life. Uh, in the cultures that accept reincarnation, it's quite natural for the parents to ask more questions. And if the child is showing really strong emotions about it, maybe pursue it and try and find the past life family. It wasn't, I suppose, until she was about 16 that she started to allow herself to think about what had been going on. And it was about then she discovered um, country music and eventually Irish music, which absolutely blew her mind. She hadn't known such music existed and she didn't realize that this was her music, this was the music she was comfortable with. Jenny accepted that her memories could actually be of real people. She felt that she had to find out more about what she saw as her previous life. 
As a child, she drew maps of where she used to live. Using these, she set out to find out if the memories she felt so strongly were real. She had the little map that she had drawn years ago, and she asked the bookseller in Toaster to get her a map of Ireland. And they both put it against the map of Malahide. The north was where it was supposed to be. The road to Dublin was the road she'd called the road to the city, I think. The road where she'd lived as Mary was there. Everything was exactly where she had said it was, which was a, a huge step forward for her because it began to feel that this was right. This really was as she had always imagined it to be. The, the owner of the bookshop was really quite surprised when I put my little drawing next to it. And it was a fairly accurate drawing of the, the main routes through the middle of Malahide. So I that was then able to confirm and move on from there. The memories were right at the front of my mind, and there was no way I could spend years trying to um, compartmentize them again. Uh, I couldn't shut them away again, uh, so I had to act on it. And it's then that um, I realized I'd have to go to Ireland. Jenny now knew that the answer to the mystery lay in Ireland. She had to find the village that she believed had been her home. When I went back to Malahide, and I say back to, uh, it was the first time I went uh, this, in this body, but um, I was able to walk around uh, through the village, recognize things. There's a sense of belonging that it was, um, or had been my home. It was like going back to my hometown. It was uh, very easy to feel comfortable in Malahide. Once I was able to find where the cottage was and confirm that these were real people, as I had always thought, all the self-doubt was uh, washed away and I was able to then trace the family. Mary Sutton's short life in Malahide ended tragically at the age of 37. She left behind five young children who had to fend for themselves. All of the memories that I have have a sense of unfinished business. Um, certainly the, the, the main thing with the, the life in Ireland, which finished early, was that uh, the separation from the children, not knowing what had happened to them, the sense of failing in my responsibility. So it was a sense of failure and guilt that carried over that I could not come to terms with. In Jenny's case, the motivating uh, emotion was this feeling of unfinished business. Um, and as, as she progressed in life and got near to the age when she died, it, that sort of peaked. Mary Sutton's children had been separated shortly after their mother's death. Jenny's extensive research finally enabled her to trace the family and bring about a bizarre family reunion. Strange when I met the children all together, children, I mean they were in their sort of 60s and 70s by then. I didn't really recognize their faces very much except um, Christy looked the, the image of his grandfather. Their, their characters, I, Frank was still very quiet and shy and I still felt very protective towards him. It was many months before the family could begin to accept Jenny's incredible story. But after those first few meetings, her deep and intimate knowledge of their childhood seemed undeniable. They would be um, asking me, the younger ones would be asking me where the windows were and what room they were in uh, and were quite happy for me to explain where things were. They were accepting that I did remember the cottage. Sonny, the eldest son, I think was a bit, bit taken aback by the whole thing. And in the end, he was completely convinced. He said, this woman knows things that only I know and only my mother knows. In fact, one or two things nobody else, even his brothers and sisters, didn't know. 
one or two of the things really took him by surprise because there were things that nobody outside the family knew about. Nobody outside the family knew that they were poaching, certainly didn't know how they were poaching, and the, 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 the detailed descriptions of where they managed to trap um, particular animals. So he, he really was quite shocked by one or two of the bits and would turn to me and say, but how could you possibly have known that? She's not somebody that is really trying to push a belief in reincarnation, not even on her past life family. But she is saying to us, I came into this life with these memories. I've pursued them. I've uncovered my past life family. This is something that maybe we affects us all, that we are all souls on a journey. And for that reason alone, I think we should be looking at the, what she told us in some detail and contemplating the, the implications of that. If Jenny is right, and we, we, we are reincarnated over and over again, that has a tremendous uh, bearing on the way we lead our lives and, and our future lives as well. When I met Sonny, uh, the oldest son, uh, he was able to explain that he used to go caddying for the golfers on the island across the inlet. And at dusk, he would come across on a little rowboat, little ferry boat, back to the jetty and um, hand over his earnings, some of his earnings. And his mother would, was always there to meet him and walk back with him. A very strange object was seen by him and uh, today it stands the test of time of one of the most bizarre incidents in the world of ufology. I was actually standing at the kitchen sink peeling potatoes. I saw this, uh, it was like a, a big orange glow or a glowing light in the sky. It was way in the distance, away towards the west. And it was strange. I didn't pay it too much attention to start off with, but after a couple of minutes, I realized that this seemed to be hovering. It obviously wasn't a helicopter or airplane or anything like that, but it was strange. It just seemed to come from nowhere and came up in an arch, but it was very precise in the way it moved, um, arching up there and came up to about 90 degrees. When it got up to that point, as it started to move away again, another one appeared, just took the very same flight path, and then a third one appeared. There's no way any helicopter or aeroplane could have possibly moved like that. Something I've just never seen before. Don't suppose I'll ever see it again either. Barbara Gerard's story of strange things in the night sky will ring true to the many thousands of people who claim to have witnessed alien visits to this planet. But her story of lights in the sky may also be linked to another unusual encounter nearby. Six hours before Barbara's sighting, forestry worker Bob Taylor was working in nearby woods. This morning I was doing my usual work at Deckman Hill. I walked out through the wood. Eventually we come to a clearing. I just couldn't believe what was in front of me when I turned the corner into this clearing. Bob described the craft standing in the clearing as a huge dome with what looked like windows and a large flange around the outside. As he stood there transfixed, two smaller globes he thought looked like sea mines dropped from the rear of the craft and rushed towards him from either side. They wrestled him to the ground and began to drag him towards the larger craft. After that, I can't really tell you what happened to it. I just passed out. The attack on Bob Taylor left him unconscious for several minutes. His face grazed 
and his clothes torn, he gradually drifted back into consciousness. Bob could not recall what had happened to him. Exhausted and disorientated, he staggered home and managed to alert the police. With no other witnesses and no explanation for his condition, PC Bill Douglas of Lothian and Borders Police was treating Bob's experience as a case of assault. I went to see Bob on the Sunday at his home. I could see he was still a bit shaken by his experience. But I asked him, what can you tell me about this stupidity? And I, uh, I got a straightforward uh, reply. He says, I might think it was stupid, but uh, uh, something certainly happened up there. And I believed him, because all I was looking for was a reaction. That I believe uh, what he told me was quite true. During the interview, I was quite taken with him. He wasn't trying to enhance uh, the situation. He walked down to this clearing, stood there on that point, and in front of him was this craft over there in the trees. He could see it. The bottom was uh, a sphere, a spherical, uh, with a, like a, a rim, like a saucer, round it. And the top was dome-like, but it was translucent, so he couldn't really get a good look at it. And while he was standing there, these two machines, or robots, if you wish, came from the rear of the machine and circled around him. They had like hooves on some of the legs and hooks on the others. And they grabbed either side of his trousers and gripped him by the thighs and pulled him forward to such an extent they pulled him off his balance and they landed down on the ground and they started dragging him towards the craft over there. He was nauseated, he couldn't speak, he had a terrible pounding headache. These are totally different symptoms from your normal run-of-the-mill person who sees a UFO. This we're talking about is completely close contact with something unbelievable. It was the next morning when we heard it on the news, I wish you could have seen my husband's face. <laughs> and that was when I decided to phone the police in Glenworth us and they told me there was actually an incident room set up in Lothian. And the guy that was there, I'm sure he, th well, I know he thought I was an absolute idiot. But when I said to him, you know, I said, I don't even want my name mentioned. It's just that I, you know, I, I do believe what this man saw because I know what I saw. And I just want, you know, to know that I did see something. What it was, I don't know, but I want you to know that I saw those three objects in the sky. Barbara's story was unusual, but police were astonished by Bob's experience. When they examined the scene, they found strange indentation marks on the ground, which were recorded by an amateur cameraman at the time. Bob himself was over there by that big tree. The indentations in the ground, there was one down here and the other down here. Uh, the marks on the ground from the two spheres, the two mine-like spheres that uh, actually attacked him, ran from behind here, behind these marks, and swung around both sides of the tracks and grabbed Bob over there, pulling him forward towards the machine here. Bob claims that he saw these two spherical objects which descended from beneath this larger object rolled across the grass, making sucking or plopping noises on the grass and pulled them, very, very forcibly pulled them at the hips towards this larger object. But the marks here were very, very different because it was like a scuffle. It was like um, you could physically see the distortion in the grass as if someone had been dragged physically for about two yards. The grainy amateur footage was of little help to the investigation, but police continued to examine the site. I searched this area looking for something that might have picked this machine up, but there was nothing else out there, nowhere for it to go. There were no reversing away and there was no tracks driving away. The only way this machine that was sitting here, must have been something like a couple of tons, could leave here was to go up through there. Well, after I'd finished interviewing Bob, 
Uh, we had some tangible evidence here regarding his clothing, which had been damaged in this uh, assault. So uh, I obtained the clothing from him, and uh, we sent that off to the Forensics Department in Edinburgh for examination. The good thing about this particular case is the fact that not only do we have a witness who has seen something absolutely fantastic, we have in our possession the actual trousers that Robert Taylor wore on that eventful day on November the 9th, 1979. These trousers, they actually show rips on the left hand side, on the right hand side, just below the pockets. This is where these spikes, these rods were emitted and grabbed him. These rips are consistent with the testimony of Robert Taylor. The, the result from the forensic department uh, uh, corroborated the fact that uh, these machines had attached themselves to Bob's trousers and had pulled them up and forward, causing the rips. The large amount of physical evidence police gathered didn't help to solve the case. It was passed on for further investigation. The case was considered serious enough for CID to take over, so all I had to do was uh, make out my statement and uh, my sketch of this uh, location here and submit it to CID. They treated this just like a criminal episode. They fenced off the, the particular area by a wire fence, they put a fence around it to stop members of the public coming in and destroying any evidence that was there, which clearly there were. Bob's attackers were never found. The police file remains open. I know they attacked me, but I don't believe they were there to do me any harm, you know. Before all this happened, I wasn't really a believer. But now I have to think, are we the only planet with uh, intelligent beings on it, there must be something else out there. Robert Taylor said he saw something very bizarre, which didn't conform to a helicopter or any flying machine that he has ever saw in his, in his life. And uh, today it stands the test of time of one of the most bizarre incidents in the world of ufology. I know what I saw, and I believe what I saw.